All right, welcome back to the podcast. My guest today is my colleague, Vera Menz. Vera is a Team 82 researcher. She works largely on embedded device security as well as OT and IoT, IIoT vulnerability research. Today, a uh, pretty big day for her. She spoke at B-Sides Tel Aviv and gave a great technical talk on hacking flow computers. So I'll let Vera go into all the technical details, but uh, these computers are pretty important to the safety of industrial processes. And her talk digs into the steps it took to develop the attack that she did uh, and how she got root access to one of these devices. Um, and if we have a minute at the end too, I wanna let Vera talk about her experience at Pwn to Own Miami, which was the, uh, the ICS version of the popular hacking contest and an article she wrote for Read Me about it. Um, I'll link to that article here in the show notes as well. Uh, before we talk to Vera, I want to give you my usual reminder to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. We're seeing a lot of new listeners, and I suspect there are many of you who are fairly new to industrial cybersecurity and IoT cyber. Um, I've been lucky to have some of the, the best and, and really smart people um, in the field on my podcast to discuss yeah, a lot of technical stuff, but some strategic uh, nuances around the industry too. So uh, spread the word and subscribe if you haven't already. It's uh, it really helps. So let's bring in Vera and and talk about her presentation today. Hi, Vera. How are you? Hey, Mike. Very excited to be here today. I, I'm very glad you're here. Yeah, thanks. Congratulations on your talk. Thank um, you. Tell me about how how you uh, why did you decide to to go after this particular topic and. Uh, it's very exciting, I'm sure, to speak at a B-Sides. These, these shows have been around for a while, and they're they're pretty popular. Yeah, we ha uh, the B-Sides uh, conference had been uh, online, uh, just uh, held from physical uh, uh, conference for uh, two years, and it was pretty exciting. Uh, it is uh, It was a pretty uh, big audience, uh, I think the bigger that I have ever had. Uh, so it was pretty exciting for me. I I happy that it's over. Yeah, I'm sure. For now, I'm sure, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It must be a little strange to speak in front yeah. of people again after two years, three years, whatever it's been. Yeah. I'm um, sure. So this topic of flow computers, um, I know it's very specific. It's very technical. Um, just kind of give me a quick description of what a, a flow computer is. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so flow computers are uh, actually the computers that, uh, as the name suggests, uh, are responsible for the flow measurement uh, of gas or oil uh, or any other substance. Uh, there is a, a lot of calculations and it can be uh, somewhat not trivial to calculate flow of uh, the gas, for example, if you uh, take uh, some pipe and move just uh, the gas through it and you want to calculate how much volume it uh, takes uh, from, uh, for the pipe to move from one point to another to another and uh, it's not that the volume of the gas right because gas uh, can uh, volume can shrink and uh, the uh, pressure of the gas is very important. So there is a lot of calculation, uh, mathematical calculations that had to be done. And for this, we need an actually a CPU and real chip that will be able to do it in the real time. And uh, there is some standards that uh, define what uh, flow computers are and they define is the management of the alarms and logging as well with uh, with the flow measurement in the, the real time. So everyone uh, in the business in uh, the industrial um, sector that wants to buy a flow computer, it is pretty defined device. Uh, you buy uh, some uh, computer which it which can be enclosed in uh, some metal enclosing that can be be mounted on the wall or on the pipe. It can be a uh, fireproof or uh, stuff like that, and it has a 
a CPU within it, it has an, an operating system, and it has all the peripherals, and the most important, importantly, uh, it has all communication uh, ports that it needs uh, in, in order to be able to communicate with other devices. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, it's a, a rack. Uh, it is just uh, like in any uh, other computer, like looks much smaller and runs on battery or on some uh, uh, some uh, by some other means. Uh, but it has one specific uh, one specific goal is it is just to calculate this mathematical calculation and give uh, this output. So you're very likely to find these in the field somewhere attached to a pipe as opposed to in a computer room somewhere, right? Right, right. In some uh, gas processing fields or uh, water uh, plants, uh, something mm-hmm. like that. In any place that, uh, that uh, measures some substance in within the pipes, uh, any, pl- any place like that would like to know how much volume of that subst- substance is going through that pipe. Uh, so so it. is it fair to say that they're um, critical computers to the, the safety of the process as well, not just keeping the process uh, working? It, it, this is about safety as well, correct? Sure. It- in, it is uh, it is matter what do you mean by safety, but if we will uh, talk about uh, physical safety, you can imagine, for example, if uh, those measurements are taken as an input to some other uh, computation. For example, we have some uh, machines that takes uh, these measurements of the uh, volume of gas and upon these measurements does some other thing. So if uh, this computer is compromised if it is not reliable anymore. So the whole system becomes uh, not reliable. And mm-hmm. some, since uh, the gas and oil are uh, substances that need to be uh, calculated uh, accurately, it is pretty serious uh, deal. Uh, where uh, one of those computers being uh, compromised. So mm-hmm. we need to to guard them. We need to be sure that those are not in the uh, hands of the attackers. So from an attacker's point of view, it makes sense to to target these devices? Yeah, for sure. They are, uh, yeah. they are small devices, uh, which yeah. has uh, uh, a yeah. very uh, a, a small memory, probably running pretty old uh, operating system. And it's a good goal for an attacker. Right. So uh, explain a, a little bit, you know, about what you discovered in, um, in look, you looked at a particular vendor's um, flow computer and you found some issues kind of, you know, from a high level, describe what you found and also talk about how difficult it is to, if it's difficult to attack these flow computers, is it expensive? Do you need a lot of knowledge about them going into uh, planning such an attack? Yeah. Uh, so it's a wide question. I will try to answer it. Sure. No, yeah. start. Uh, so we chose a flow computer from ABB. It could be uh, any other. We tried to uh, choose our target based on what uh, we know that uh, is going on in the plants uh, themselves. Uh, so we, so our research will be meaningful for our customers. And uh, so we went for uh, that target. Uh, it was uh, what we have discovered over there is uh, is that it was pretty easy uh, to be able to uh, control the writing and reading uh, files on the device. And uh, while reading files uh, and writing them in any place on the device, it can be very dangerous. For example, I can uh, mm-hmm. just substitute some uh, scripts that, uh, or, or code that uh, runs on the 
boot and that's it. Uh, I have uh, right now a uh, code execution. How uh, easy it's for an attacker, it will depend whether the device is connected and where it connected to. For example, uh, we believe there is that there are a lot of devices, such devices that are connected for uh, the internet itself. It should not be happening, but it happens. We see it every time. And even if, even if it's not connected to the internet, but uh, does for the uh, local LAN, uh, when the attacker is within the network, uh, it's it's game over uh, for those devices. So uh, be, the device of a uh, device availability within the network is uh, very important from a, a attacker point of view. Uh, and for your question about how hard uh, for us uh, the vulnerability researchers to start with uh, those kind of devices is depends also on how many uh, the researcher have uh, an experience in this type of devices because we get a pretty big uh, blob of stripped binary and uh, we need to understand what it is. We need to understand where the important uh, logic within the device. Uh, we do not have a lot of time to do it. We want our uh, research uh, be uh, sh uh, relatively short. Um, so it wasn't that hard in that perspective. I saw uh, some targets that uh, had, uh, had a much uh, harder uh, point of uh, entrance, but uh, it, w it was not that trivial. Uh, it, we did some research for a, a couple of weeks and it took us time, it took us time to uh, find the vulnerability and uh, to disclose it to the vendor, of course, um, mm -hmm. and to wait for it to patching. You ask also about, uh, is it expensive? <laughs> so for us, it wasn't at all. Um, although uh, today Raspberry Pi, it's not something that is easy for, to find, but we have uh, some ARM, ARM computers uh, in our closet all, all the time, so we just picked one. Uh, we, we took the firmware from the uh, web, it is available online, and uh, extracted it and just put it to the Raspberry Pi and we had our own flow computer without pipes and everything. It was pretty cool. So that's neat. So yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about your setup and how you kind of recreate something like this. So that's how you did it. You you just extracted the firmware to the, to the Raspberry Pi? Is that Right. It, it's just, not, yeah, in a high level, that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, we, we, as a, as a framework can be thought about uh, like some package that uh, has a bootloader and kernel and a lot of other files. And the important uh, one for us is the file system directory. So we're just taking this one and copying it to the Raspberry Pi. And once we did that, the Raspberry Pi already have an OS. It has a everything. It's uh, just a computer that we run uh, with mm -hmm. ARM chip. So we just uh, do something that calls such root. Uh, it, it changes the context of the root to that same directory. And once we are there, we can uh, we can run any binary that uh, the real device can. The disadvantage of uh, this technique is that we still uh, have a binary that interacts with uh, the peripherals. And now we don't have those. We don't have the sensors. We don't have the pipes. We don't have uh, the board that uh, the flow computer has. So uh, we need to either to emulate those or to uh, just change the binary itself, just uh, change the, uh, the binary on the assembly level. So it just won't call the functions that uh, making trouble. And that's what we did. Uh, we opened uh, the assembly in uh, the, our disassembler. We found the problematic function. We just erased the functionality uh, within the assembly code 
put it back and run again. And uh, that's it. After a, a couple of hours, uh, it uh, all the interaction with the peripherals uh, is patched and we can start working with the uh, our Raspberry Pi, as uh, the same way as we would uh, work with the Flow computer, what, which is pretty cool, right? Because the Raspberry Pi is yeah. very small and easy uh, to operate. Is, is that how an operator would work with something like this in learning it? Not obviously not running the process, but w- would an operator work this way at all? I would not suggest for the operator yeah. to work like this because it's still very different from from the flow computer in a sense of the flow measurement and uh, such. Mm-hmm. Uh, it we need always to remember that we are uh, as the security researchers are uh, our goal is to break the device to find the vulnerabilities and not to ensure that the uh, computer is working properly uh, without bugs or so. Uh, we do not care if the values uh, are accurate. We do not care if uh, we patch the health of the binary so the uh, binary will work without the peripherals. We just care about the main logic. Uh, so maybe I could advise for some uh, courses if you if you're given a course or something and you just cannot buy uh, this device so maybe it will be a, an option for you uh, but not for an operator that uh, should work on the device itself afterwards it just will mm-hmm. uh, it will uh, just uh, drive him away i think it's not <laughs> a good option for him right so it, you you just said it. You try to break a device. So the, the first part of that is getting in, correct? And I mean, I think I think that's the first part of your attack as well. You found an authentication bypass, and that gave you access to the device. And then from there, you you found other issues. Can you talk a little bit from a high level about the vulnerabilities that you found? Yeah, sure. And and what they enable. So so you said it yourself. Uh, the first thing that we have found is uh, the authentication bypass. Uh, those devices uh, are not designed in the first place to be in with security in mind. And that is important. There is some security features, but when you look uh, uh, on them from modern point of view, you seem you see that uh, they are st- uh, they are worthless. So, and this is what uh, was in our case. Uh, this device had an authentication. It has a, a security switch that can enable a security passcode. It's very similar to one we have on our phones when we want to uh, lock our phone. But Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, uh, when we are, for example, if someone will uh, will steal your your phone, he won't able to go over all uh, uh, versions of the passcode to uh, until he guesses the correct one. Uh, why? Because after five or six time, your uh, phone will be locked, and it says something like "try in another hour or so." Uh, right. So that is just mitigation against an attacker that uh, trying to brute force the pin code. And this is smart that will uh, prevent from an attacker to get to our uh, device. But those type of computer, uh, they, gen- they just don't uh, have this ability. So this passcode uh, can be just guessed uh, with a brute force attack because there is no rate limit to it. Um, and that's it. That's how we had it. That uh, <laughs> that's how uh, we uh, bypass uh, the authentication. I have to say that uh, there is a role-based authentication uh, control uh, on the ecosystem of the ABB, mm-hmm. but uh, for our devices, it uh, was implemented only on the client side and not on the device itself. Uh, so it won't matter for an attacker that uh, uh, doesn't care about the client size, the side is away. 
Um, the second vulnerability uh, was uh, uh, past traversal. Uh, there is an ability uh, with which I, uh, everyone's operator can uh, download and upload uh, files from the device uh, just to be able to maintain it uh, in case of uh, some files lost or some configuration yeah. lost. Uh, it is a pretty common feature. So uh, what we uh, saw is that when the file was requested, uh, they did not check uh, the path of the file, whether it should be uh, written or read or not. So we just uh, just can uh, take the relative path of uh, the file that we are requ requesting and make it uh, be uh, any path that we uh, want file files of uh, any of any file on the system and that's what we did they did not have any mitigation for it uh, of course uh, this vulnerability uh, was fixed and it's not uh, something that uh, available anymore on the new versions mm -hmm. so basically what you can do is just upload a new file and make it execute that one as opposed to the one it's designed to execute, correct? Is that a uh, accurate not, description? Uh, not that accurate. I can write and read any file on the system. So it okay. can be configuration files, it can be uh, executables, it can be uh, anything. And we went, we went for something uh, simpler than uh, code execution. We just uh, we just switched uh, the SSH configuration and uh, plugged in the SSH and just connected uh, to SSH with uh, the key that we have entered because we could, we have a right access. And mm -hmm. that's it, we had a full control uh, over the device and that's it, the, device, the target is ours. Right, right, which is what the ultimate objective is. Um, so from a security perspective, can these devices support basic security, like encrypting the firmware, signing the firmware, things like that, um, that would help you know an operator understand if there's been a change or prevent a change from happening that's not authorized? Can, do these flow computers in general, can they support basic security? Yeah, sure. Uh, we need to understand what we are trying to defend against uh, because uh, even if uh, the firmware were signed, it won't, uh, it won't uh, help here because I'm not trying to change the firmware. I'm uh -huh. exploiting a, the code within the firmware that's already running, and I'm not trying to change it. For example, one of the attack vectors that could be is that I uh, I had a arbitrary update of uh, files, and I would uh, be able to upgrade to a new firmware. In that case, it just won't work because uh, the firmware is signed, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I can not uh, generate the signature. But uh, in this case, I'm already within the firmware. Uh, to decrypt the firmware, uh, it can help, uh, sure, not with this uh, one uh, again for the same reason, but uh, by creating the firmware, uh, mostly you will uh, hide your code not only for from the attackers but also from the researchers and uh, the attacker if he wants uh, to decrypt your firmware uh, he and has all resources for it uh, and uh, he probably would able to. Uh, why? Because if you're uh, putting your, uh, for example, your files online, so there will be the version that uh, first encrypt the, the first version that has uh, uh, the firmware in, uh, encrypted, and it somehow need to decrypt, uh, and more often uh, than not, the decryption key is within the firmware itself. So we just take... It makes it real easy. <laughs> yeah, that's how we bypass it. Right. I guess it can be uh, designed well, 
but it won't help against uh, this t- uh, type of attack because it, right. it, it will be, for me, much harder uh, to research, of course. I won't be able to have the femur right away. But once it's on and it's working, uh, the encryption of the femur and the, it being signed is not important in that perspective. Right. So... A talk like the one you gave today obviously is important to uh, expose, you know, potential problems like this in, in these important computers. A two-part question, are facilities, do you think that they are aware that flow computers might be a, a target for a cyber attack? And, you know, the second part of the question is how, to, how would they defend themselves? What do they need to do if they're not doing it already? So for the first question, uh, I think that uh, it's hard uh, today not to be aware of uh, cyber attacks on industrial devices. And uh, it's easy to uh, just understand that any there is no there is no something special about flow computer or any other. Uh, Those computers are are not known uh, to all, and uh, we didn't he- heard about them uh, until mm-hmm. lately. And uh, the, re- uh, the reduction from the flow computer to any other is pretty simple. Uh, I think that uh, we already understand here that uh, that uh, cyber attacks on those types of computer are uh, not going to anywhere anywhere. Uh, I will have uh, my job for a long time. I will have uh, <laughs> something to do, which is nice for me. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, there is a lot of disadvantages of it. Uh, it's uh, going to stay and we need to be aware of it. And the more attacks will uh, will appear, the more aver- awareness it will uh, it will give to all of us. Uh, about how uh, we can to uh, prevent those attacks is first we need to understand that our uh, network is uh, closed and uh, only authorized uh, authorized personnel can uh, get into the network because as I said earlier if the device is not connected to internet at all uh, uh, not collected, uh, not connected to the LAN, so there is nothing to do. There is nothing attacker can do. It's not right. available. <laughs> so uh, we need to understand uh, what we uh, share, what attack vectors uh, are uh, available when we plug uh, the inter- Ethernet cable into the device. Uh, we need to ensure that those are not uh, going to the public internet. It happens. It happens a lot, and we should not see that much uh, devices open to the network. Um, and for sure, we need to uh, be uh, to update our uh, our devices every every time it is available. To, uh, ABB issued an update for. Uh, this vulnerability and everyone who has its device in his plant should uh, update its device the same way that we are updating uh, our browsers we learned in the uh, last decade to do it it was pretty uh, we were unaware of it uh, 10 20 years ago and it right. was pretty awkward to update everything uh, but <laughs> right now it's just part of our life because we understand that it's crucial for our security and this will happen in the industrial world as well just i hope that not too late <laughs> yeah no i think it's coming it, it's you can feel it, it that something's different and you can feel people yeah, are, are paying for attention sure. for sure you see it yeah I, I can hear it in your voice. You really love your job. You love what you do. Yeah, I enjoy it very much. <laughs> I, I had been a year right now uh, at uh, 
at the team at the right. team at Clarity and the best year I had so far for sure. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. So, all right, before we finish, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, your experience, your participation in, in Pwn to Own uh, Miami, the ICS contest. Um, you were definitely part of developing some of the attacks that went into uh, Team 82's entries. Uh, they focused on the OPC UA, the ones that you were involved with, some of them. Just kind of, exp- you know, take me through the your participation, what it meant to you. Uh, and ultimately, obviously, finding a zero day in, in something like OPC is, is a pretty big deal, right? Yeah, for sure. I heard about uh, Pontone competitions before we have entered. I was familiar with it. It's really a high-profile competition and uh, not for uh, beginners, to say <laughs> the least. And... Uh, Clarity participating in this uh, competition. It's uh, it's not first time. Uh, so uh, Sharon uh, was used to he, w- he was used to competition to its rules, uh, but for me it was pretty new. It was uh, my first time in uh, such competition, and uh, I was very stressful. Everyone. Everyone wants to be a part of the discoveries to find zero days. And it's hard because we have some uh, number of targets. Uh, those targets were reviewed before. Uh, we, we at Clarity review them every now and then. And I remember that uh, in the beginning, uh, that uh, Sharon uh, told us that uh, uh, he's not sure about what we can find uh, because uh, the targets uh, themselves were uh, participating in the uh, competition last year and mm-hmm. as i said uh, we uh, we should some cvs on them uh, uh, within a, a year before ponton so I was not sure if we will be able to find anything. And uh, as I said, I was uh, pretty stressful about it. But uh, we took our time. We started pretty early. And the competition itself uh, was postponed. It uh, gave us uh, another uh, a couple of weeks more to prepare. Uh, and I I remember uh, the day that uh, I remember it very vividly uh, the day that uh, the father that I wrote uh, found a bug in uh, the, mm-hmm. in one of the targets that uh, we were pursuing, and it's hard to <laughs> describe that feeling. It's just like, did I just do it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> did, did I just found something? Uh, so uh, it 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 was a uh, it was a uh, work from all uh, from all the team. It was uh, uh, not only mine, uh, especially the exploitation itself. Uh, but I'm very proud to uh, be part of it uh, to uh, to find the bugs that uh, lead us to uh, exploitation of Kepler. Uh, uh, Kept for application, which gave us uh, 20 points out of 45. Uh, so it was uh, pretty cool. We were the only ones that uh, uh, who successfully exploited the, uh, the bug. So it was uh, pretty exciting. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm glad you described your reaction when you found the vulnerability because I remember watching... Uh, Sharon on the on the stream from Pwn to Own, how happy he was when the attack actually worked. One of the attacks that he submitted actually worked. Yeah, I so I, I could tell the feeling. Yeah, I could tell the feeling that you know that it's such a relief and it's you know just confirms all the the good work you guys did. So you should be proud yeah. of yourself. It was great. Yeah. Um, so last question. I know that you you kind of. You you had a different start to your career uh, as a developer, correct? As a programmer, is that? Yeah, 
Yeah, I true? started. Did you take a chance coming to to a research team? Was that something you had in mind, or how did that happen? Uh, sure, uh, it was uh, as uh, I described in the article that you referred to. Uh, it yeah. was a, a third, a second year uh, after uh, graduating from my computer science degree. I was a software developer, and uh, I I knew that something was missing, but uh, I also knew that uh, the research and especially the vulnerability one is not something uh, that is easy to enter. And at that time, it it didn't seem possible to me. So when I decided to quit my job, I was pretty aware of that. I'm not progressing myself as a software engineer anymore. I'm just putting uh, that as it is. I will be, as for programming uh, point of view, I will be uh, always be a junior programmer where my friends will uh, advance themselves uh, to the higher level. And I put all of this uh, and took a chance uh, that I didn't know will pan out. I didn't know it back then. Oh, right. uh, take me four years ago. You will uh, say uh, you will tell me that I will be talking to you uh, about some uh, research that I gave uh, just my talk about at B-Sides. I will, <laughs> I will tell you, shut up. It's not true. <laughs> it won't happen. Uh, but it did, and it was. I I remember the, uh, the time that uh, with the first interview with Sharon, and uh, how excited I uh, was for the opportunity uh, to be mm-hmm. part of that amazing and talented uh, team, and uh, yes, it did pan out, and. I'm so happy for it. I wouldn't look back. But at the time, it was pretty frightening. I won't lie. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I was. There were times that I just um, thought that maybe I did a mistake and I would be some, maybe some senior uh, software engineer by now and what I'm doing and where am I heading and right. maybe it won't be able, pos- it won't be possible anyway. So. Yeah, it was frightening. <laughs> That's how good things happen, though. You have to take a risk sometimes, right? Yeah, sure. But uh, you probably hear most of the good things that happen and not the bad ones. And right, it uh, distorts your vision a little bit. <laughs> All right. Vera, I think that's a good place to leave it. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And congratulations again on your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for inviting me. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye.